Andrew, welcome to our Waters workshop. Thank you for um, accepting uh, our present uh, our request for presenting here at the workshop. Oh, thank so, you for having me. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Andrew Miles, uh, he's a physical geographer with research interest in coastal processes and coastal management. Uh, he's uh, as well as he has broader research interest in the applications of GIS, as you might have already noticed. Uh, and remote sensing across a range of topics. Uh, his research interest focuses on two overlapping areas. First, the coastal dynamics, and uh, in particular, the challenge of uh, integrating understanding of coastal processes over a variety of spatial and temporal scales. So any problems with scales, this is the man to ask all the questions. And secondly, a broader research interest uh, in spatial analysis, and applications of geographical information system. And of course, uh, GI, uh, remote sensing, which extends beyond the realm of only physical geography. So he also works with human geography and other aspects of geography. Um, so I'll um, leave the uh, floor to you, Andrew. Um, so um, you. you can start your presentation whenever you are ready. Okay. That's great. Thanks a lot, Namrata. Um, so thank you for the introduction. So like Namrata said, so I'm not really a, a specialist in flood vulnerability as such, although within my kind of specialism in coastal processes, I do touch on coastal flooding. But I think I was really kind of invited to, to speak today to cover the, the GIS aspect. And in particular, one of the, the areas that I'm quite interested in um, is open source GIS and open data, because there are so many freely available tools, freely available data sets now. Um, and I think there's so much value in making use of these, these tools and data sets um, across many different disciplines. So my talk today is really looking at open source GIS and open data and how we can use it to hopefully improve our understanding of, of flood risk and vulnerability. So just to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. So I provide a bit of context for my talk. And I'm going to start quite generically with just looking at what is open source data, um, or sorry, open source software, and in particular, kind of open source GIS tools. Um, and then I'm going to kind of look a little bit at open data as well, because it's no use having the tools if we don't have data sets to work with. Um, and I'm then going to kind of bring it back a bit more specifically to flood vulnerability and look at some of the available data sets that we have that might be able to help us if we're considering um, mapping flood vulnerability um, in, in any particular part of the world. So the reason that I think this is useful um, is really that if we're going to look at managing any kind of hazard, really, um, flooding or, or otherwise, then there's a number of things that we need to, to help us do that. And normally the first thing that we need is data. If we don't have data, then we've not got any basis to, to make our decisions. We can't make um, informed decisions. Once we have data, we then need tools that allow us to actually analyze that data, to process it, um, and to hopefully generate some usable insights on the hazard that we're looking at. Um, and once we've kind of got those insights, got some knowledge and understanding, we then need to be able to communicate those to whoever our audience might be, whether that's other academics, whether that's various stakeholders, whether that's members of the public who we need to kind of communicate the, the risk and vulnerability issues to. Um, and throughout that process, there's always limitations. And some of those key limitations are in terms of the resources that we actually have available to us. Um, whether those resources are financial and, you know, I'm sure all of us would like to have a bit more money available to, to help us do what we do, but we have to work with, with what we've got. Um, those resources could be in terms of the time available um, to work on the project, or it could be human resources, the kind of manpower and skills that we have available to, to support us. And hopefully I will kind of show you that we can make use of, of open source GIS and open data to hopefully help us at least slightly mitigate some of those, those resource issues to help us get the tools and data sets um, that we need. 
So starting kind of a bit more generically, um, and I think as far as I know, there's a kind of range of backgrounds and, and skills in the room. So if some of you kind of know this already, I apologize, but hopefully to some of you, this will be um, interesting. So what is open source software and why is it useful? So I'm actually going to start with the flip side. Um, so most of the kind of traditional software that a lot of us use is what's known as proprietary. Somebody owns it. Um, and this is things like Microsoft Office, uh, Microsoft Windows, Photoshop, Adobe software, um, ArcGIS, if we're working within the, the GIS discipline, um, and things like iTunes, Apple products. So proprietary software, we don't necessarily have to pay for, although in many cases we do. But actually, just because something's free is actually slightly different from being open source. It can be freely available, but the, the developers might provide that for a reason. They still don't give us kind of full access to be able to share and modify what they do. Now, a lot of people like proprietary software. Um, it definitely has some, some upsides. Um, in particular, if we're paying for a product, we can usually expect a certain level of quality from it. You know, with paid money, we expect that it's going to work. It's going to do the job that we want it to do. Um, and we normally expect that we're going to get a certain level of support that might vary from product to product. But at the very least, you'd expect there'll be someone there who can make sure you can get it set up and running, doing the things that you, you need to do with it, and hopefully kind of help you out if you have any major problems along the way. Um, the other issues with proprietary software is that in many cases, although as I said, not all, the developers make money by selling licenses for that software. So there's a cost involved in many cases to actually make use of it. And as we've said, when many of us are working to limited resources, limited funds, sometimes those um, costs can be prohibitive. Um, there's also other kind of issues sometimes. We can't copy and share it freely because it's owned by someone, they have the license. If we're working with another partner organization, uh, we may have access to that software, they may not, and we might not be able to, to actually give that to them. Um, other issues are things like we can't see how it works. The code is, is closed away, and that's one of the, the kind of key attributes of proprietary software. And again, for many of us, we might think, okay, that's fair enough, I'm not a programmer, I don't need to be able to see what's going on behind the scenes. Um, on the other hand, if we're carrying out analysis or if we want to modify something, it doesn't quite do what we want, then actually having the ability to see what's happening behind the scenes, to see the code, to change that can actually be quite valuable. And that's really where open source is, is different. So open source software, by its nature, we can see the code, we can access every, every part of it. It's freely available, so we can download it, we can give it to someone else, we can give it to people that we're working with. Um, and that's not just limited for personal and academic use. So again, many of us, we might work for academic institutions, we get cheaper licensing or free licensing of, of software. But if we want to work with commercial partners, we might not be able to share that. Um, with open source software, we can use it commercially, and, you know, whether we're an academic institution, a business, a government organization, um, we can make use of, of that software and we can share it with anyone else that, that we might be, be working with. One thing we can't do is sell it. Um, it normally does have somewhere in the license. You know, we can't make a quick book by putting this onto a CD and selling it to other people. Um, but it's there. It's available to us. We can, can modify it. We can use it. We can share it. Now, there are a couple of issues that generally put people off sometimes using open source software, particularly larger organizations a lot of the time. And that's the fact that, firstly, it's seen as not having the same guarantee of quality or functionality that proprietary software would. You know, someone's making this, they're giving it away for free. Um, but what if it doesn't quite do what we want? Who can we turn to? There's not kind of um, the same guarantees there. And equally, there's no obligation to provide support. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not going to do what it says it does. Um, and in many cases, there's very good and very comprehensive open source software. 
Um, and equally, it doesn't mean that there's going to be no support. There's often quite good communities of people who are willing to provide support through forums, through tutorial videos, websites. Um, but sometimes it can be a deterrent from people actually looking at these open source alternatives to the more expensive traditional proprietary options. And the other question that often goes through people's minds at this point is, why would anyone want to give software away for free? You know, we've got big companies like Microsoft and Adobe who are making millions or billions by selling proprietary software. So actually, why would someone want to sit there and spend many hundreds of hours developing something that does the same thing and then allow anyone to use it for free? And the main reason normally is that it answers a need. So most open source projects are developed by a community of, of people who kind of all contribute some of their time to help make this project a reality. Um, and it may well be that the reason this community of people need that software is because the commercial options either aren't available, there's nothing that does what they want, or maybe it is too expensive. You know, they have limited budgets, there's nothing there that quite does what they want, but maybe they do have some time and they can contribute that to actually building an alternative version that's then available for them to use. And the theory is that we have this community, they develop the software to answer a need, and then those people benefit by having access to that free software. And it's obviously not just the people who developed it that benefit, but anyone else can download it and use it. And that kind of grows the community. And then hopefully other people will then contribute to the project, whether that's by contributing their time and skills to developing it further, or if you don't have programming skills, by things like identifying problems and reporting them, um, or by improving documentation, writing tutorials, helping other people to, to learn about it. And the idea is we then kind of get a, a feedback loop that the software improves over time, the community add back to it, the software gets improved, and everything gets better and better. And the other reason that people develop open source software is actually there are ways to, to make money from it. Some people um, will offer support services. So actually just because we're getting an open source piece of software doesn't mean there's no support available. We might be able to pay a company um, to actually provide a support contract for that piece of software. And actually because it's open source, they may well have been involved in developing it. Often it can be more responsive than if we're working with a big company like Microsoft, because these people will actually be able to go into the code, modify it. If there's a, a major problem, they may well be able to fix that quite quickly. Um, people make money from selling training. So again, just because it's free open source software, there's still training providers who will actually be able to teach us how to, how to use it, how to do what we need to do. And obviously, some of the people who develop it will then go on to use it um, to provide consultancy services. So particularly in the GIS sector, if we develop an open source tool, we can then use that to undertake analysis um, and provide a service to, to people who need it. So it sounds quite idealistic. We've got this idea of a community who are all coming together, contributing um, in order to develop a software product um, and then improve that over time. So the question is, does this kind of ideal really work? And based on some of the um, big open source projects that are around these days, um, the answer seems to be yes. So I've got a number of examples of open source software here. Um, over on the left hand side, we have the Linux Penguin. Some of you may be familiar with, some of you might even run Linux um, on your computers, essentially an open source operating system alternative to Windows or Mac. Um, and it's actually very widely used, even if you don't use it on your desktop, because it's free and open source. A lot of manufacturers actually use it to run things like household electronics, digital video recorders, smart TVs. Um, many of them will actually be running Linux in the background as their their operating system. Because it's free, it's open source, the manufacturers can modify it to, to do what they want. Um, the Moodle virtual learning environment, some of you may use, and we certainly use that at Chester 
to provide online resources to our students and support them in their their work. That's actually another open source project that's hugely beneficial for, for kind of universities and learning institutes. VLC Media Player, widely used um, free media player for um, Windows and, and other operating systems. Um, WordPress. So if any of you have a, a WordPress blog um, or website, you may well be aware that that's an open source piece of software. And I always forget the exact statistic that some ridiculous proportion of the world's websites are actually run based on the WordPress platform. Um, open Office, open source alternative to, to Microsoft Office. Um, the Mozilla project, so some of you might use the Firefox browser, which again is free and open source. They also have a mail client and, and a few other bits of software. Um, Android mobile operating system. Um, this one often has proprietary layers on top, so we can bring open source and proprietary products together sometimes. Um, but at its core, Android is a, an open source piece of software. Um, and within the, the GIS sector, QGIS. So some pretty well-known and widely used pieces of software that are actually being developed from an open source basis. So hopefully this gives us confidence that this open source model of a community building a, a software product can work and can actually develop, uh, deliver us reliable programs that, that we can make use of. So how does this apply to the GIS sector? Um, so mapping in JS is something that I do quite a lot. And um, I like the idea that, you know, it's something that's accessible to everybody. If you've got the skills that there's the software available to, to help you use them. And actually open source has been um, a major influence in GIS for quite a long time. So it actually began back in 1982 with something called GRASS, the Geographical Resource Analysis Support System. Um, so this was a, a desktop GIS that was developed by community and is actually still updated today. So there's still new versions of GRASS um, being released, building on those foundations from 1982. Um, in the early 2000s, there were several other big projects, including the PostGIS um, database software. So allowing us to kind of store our GIS data in an open source database without having to pay for um, expensive database software. And also what was at the time called Quantum GIS um, and now officially abbreviated to QGIS, which was another desktop GIS um, product. And nowadays there are dozens, probably hundreds of different open source GIS projects in development at the moment. Um, the OSGEO Foundation um, support many of those, so you can head over to their website if you want to see some of the, the other projects that are ongoing. Um, web mapping in particular seems to have really been influenced by the growth in open source um, software. So if you're not using Google or Bing, if you're sort of developing your own web maps, then actually some of the, the major products for providing web mapping are, are open source products. So just a few examples here. So in terms of desktop software, um, Grass and QJS are two of the, the front runners. Um, in terms of web mapping, technologies like open layers and leaflets, um, libraries, JavaScript libraries for providing web mapping, um, map server used for quite a lot of um, the back end of online mapping, um, and even things like GeoMaus, which is a, a full Sort of full functional GIS analysis suite that can run through the browser. Um, and we also have GIS open source GIS projects that provide the kind of tools in the background that many of these other products need. So things like GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, that's an open source set of tools that allows us to do all kinds of things like reproject our data um, and run analysis tasks. And actually, again, because it's open source, it's actually incorporated into many of these other products to save them having to, to develop those tools from scratch. Um, and as I mentioned, the PostGIS um, database system for, for storing geospatial data. So pretty much anything that we need to do um, in terms of storing, analyzing, and distributing our spatial data, we can do with freely available open source tools. 
But obviously, it's no use having a powerful set of tools if we don't have any data to use with them. And often when we're kind of looking at a project, one of the most expensive things can be going out and collecting our own data. Um, and often that's unavoidable. There's things that we're going to need to collect. But there's actually a huge array of data already available, increasing all the time. Um, so if there's free data sets that we can make use of, that we can modify and bring into our projects, then obviously that's going to save us considerable time and money, coming back to the kind of resources point that I made earlier. So like open source software, open data product, the projects, excuse me, um, are generally freely available. If it's truly open, it can be used for any purpose, again, whether that's commercial, academic, um, or otherwise, and can be modified, updated, distributed to anyone that we, we want to share it with. And most open data sets, not all, but the majority, tend to come from one of two sources. Um, and those are either crowdsourced, where we've kind of opened it up to the general public, said, OK, we need to collect data on this particular topic, help us go out and gather it or contribute to it. Or they're government generated. And certainly in the UK, um, over the last few years, the government have increasingly been releasing their data sets as open data, even kind of high value products like airborne LIDAR data, which not many years ago would rapidly add up to thousands or tens of thousands of pounds if you wanted it covering a large area. And that's partly due to the realization that there's a lot of inherent value locked up in these data sets. And actually, once they've been collected and used for their initial purpose, if we can release those data sets for other organizations to use, then that can have huge benefits, whether that's in terms of kind of generating economic activity or improving um, the activity of, of other organizations who are providing useful services and can make use of, of these data sets. And saving costs in terms of avoiding the repetition of, of data collection. So as with um, kind of open source software, there's a huge array of products available to us. And I've put a few examples up on the screen here, some of which are kind of location specific. Um, so data.gov.uk and Ordnance Survey Open Data, uh, some of the, the UK um, open data portals, but also things like Natural Earth, which provides base mapping on a, a global scale. So if you're looking at kind of national or, or wider um, areas, then actually Natural Earth can provide you with some nice base maps to use. Um, a lot of satellite imagery and remotely sensed data is now freely available. Um, so Landsat being a, a well-known example, and actually the US um, and the USGS are pretty good at making a lot of their data freely available um, for, for kind of analysis purposes. And another big open data project, um, OpenStreetMap, which I will talk a bit more about um, in a few minutes time, but essentially an open alternative, a crowdsourced alternative to, to Google Maps, allowing anyone around the world to map their local area and contribute data to a, a global street map. And obviously, there's many other data sets available as well, and they often vary by location. So you, know, you may be familiar with open data sets available for the, the areas that you live or um, work in. Um, but if not, then it's worth spending a bit of time looking and seeing what's around, because more and more, um, there's a whole range of data sets being made freely available. So bringing this back to our sort of topic at hand, how does this help us assess flood risk and vulnerability. So obviously, the open data sets can hopefully help us fill in some of these data gaps. As I said, we may need to still go out and collect some data ourselves. But if there are kind of free open data sets that we can make use of, then that actually might considerably reduce our data collection time and costs um, by reusing those data sets. And obviously, the software in terms of open source GIS will provide us with tools um, to undertake some of the analysis that we need to do. And I'll come on to that a bit more with the, the exercise that I've um, put together to follow on from this session. And even potentially with the web mapping actually allow us tools to help communicate 
our findings to our various stakeholders. And hopefully also minimizing some of these resource issues from before. So obviously if we can use free um, open data sets and also free tools, then that's going to help reduce our financial outlay compared to paying for the licensing of other commercial products. Um, and potentially, as I said, if we can reuse some of these data sets, it's going to reduce the, the time and human resource um, limitations that we have on our projects. So just looking at a few examples um, specifically in relation to flood vulnerability mapping. So I mentioned OpenStreetMap a minute ago, and again, some of you may well be familiar with this, um, but this is a, a crowdsourced data set. So anyone anywhere in the world can sign up and contribute to OpenStreetMap. Um, and you can map all kinds of features, whether that's buildings, services, um, forests, rivers, all those kind of features are, are mapped in, in OpenStreetMap transport networks. Um, and it can actually be done in two ways. So people can either go out on the ground with GPS devices, um, map what's in their area and up upload the GPS tracks. But actually a number of satellite imaging companies also make high resolution satellite imagery available for free to the OpenStreetMap project so that people can actually map um, areas that they can't access directly. So although you might not be able to distinguish between every kind of building type or the service provided, it at least allows us to map things like roads, where buildings are, rivers, forested areas, those kind of features in, in remote locations anywhere in the world. And it also gives us a mapping platform that we can bring volunteers into. Um, so this is already happening with things like the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap project, which runs projects to encourage volunteers to map areas where there are ongoing um, crises or disasters. But equally, we could organize our own teams of volunteers and encourage them to use OpenStreetMap to map areas that we're interested in if they've not been mapped in sufficient detail already. And it also provides us with a platform to which we can upload our own data. So if you've been mapping areas, you've been collecting data on the ground, and you want to have somewhere you can combine that, you can share it with other people, then actually one option is to upload that data to, to OpenStreetMap. And that provides it in a form where you can see it alongside the existing data, other people can see it, and also anyone else working in that area will be able to download and make use of that, that data. So in in a way, it's kind of adding value potentially to, to mapping data we may already have. Um, but in particular, in terms of flood vulnerability, this can be a good source of information on critical infrastructure. If we're working in an area that doesn't have good national mapping or nothing that's freely available, then often OpenStreetMap may well give us data on things like schools, hospitals, um, transport infrastructure, and um, key features of, of that sort. And just an example of how OpenStreetMap can be used to contribute. Um, so I'm going to see if this makes too much noise to go over the top of me. Um, I'm not sure if your um, stream has quite caught up with me yet, because I can see in the background on Namrata's video that I'm still on the last page. Ah, here we go. So a major um, example of where OpenStreetMap was used to aid in disaster response, so not directly a, a flood example, it was actually following the, the Haiti earthquake. Um, so before the Haiti earthquake, actually Haiti was very poorly mapped, even kind of official mapping had very little detail. Um, and obviously, even where we do have detailed mapping, following a disaster, things change. Bridges are destroyed, buildings collapse, displaced people's camps spring up. Um, and if we're trying to organize a response to that disaster, then we need to know where those things are. So immediately following the earthquake, a number of satellite imaging companies released freely very high resolution imagery of, of Haiti to actually allow people to, to map um, the region in OpenStreetMap to help support the humanitarian response. Um, and if this works, this video kind of indicates what happened so that's the point at which the earthquake occurred. And the white flashes are indicating kind of edits people have made, additions people have made, 
um, so PT portal prints in particular went from being extremely sparsely mapped to actually to be one of the, the best mapped um, locations in the world because thousands of volunteers contributed over the, the next few days um, and actually filled in the gaps and that was vital to the, the humanitarian response. So just a kind of demonstration of how um, open data and open data platforms can actually be used in a, a kind of disaster situation. Um, another useful global data set, um, if we're looking at flood risk and vulnerability in particular, is elevation. You know, if we're trying to identify flood risk, we want to identify low-lying areas, and that will kind of identify where is, is most vulnerable to flooding. Um, and there may well be higher resolution data sets available locally, but if you're working somewhere and you want a global data set, then um, a, a useful example is the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, SRTM. Um, so this was actually collected back in 2000, and as the name suggests, it was collected from a space shuttle which had a radar instrument attached to it and essentially collected a global elevation data set. And this is now available at one arc second resolution, which is about 30 meters, so not hugely detailed, but if we're working on a citywide or regional scale, then actually that gives us a pretty good picture of the topography across that, that area. Um, and it has a, a vertical accuracy or absolute vertical accuracy of about five to nine meters. Um, now that might not sound great, but actually it's worth bearing in mind that that's absolute accuracy and the relative accuracy of neighboring pixels will actually be much better than that. So as you'll see, if you um, try the practical exercise that I've put together, it actually gives us a pretty good picture of the, the terrain in the area and helps us identify quite nicely the, the low-lying parts of the, the region. And another nice example of a, a global data set that's going to be useful to us if we're looking at vulnerability is WorldPop, um, www.worldpop.org. So this provides global demographic and population data, which is freely available under a Creative Commons license. So you can modify it, you can redistribute it, you can share it freely. Um, and it doesn't only provide full um, population data, but it also breaks it down into different age ranges and I think some other demographic categories as well. So if we're considering vulnerability, then often we might want to consider the very young, the very old. Um, so actually this gives us a, a global data set. And this is generated from a combination of the best available local kind of census and population estimates, um, but combined with some modeling methodologies to kind of give a, a data set that's consistent um, globally. So, and the, the methodology they've used for this is also very well documented. So if you go onto the methods section of their website, you'll see there's a number of peer reviewed articles that outline the methods that they've used to, to generate this, this population data. So if we're working in an area that doesn't have great population data or it's not very consistent, uh, then actually WorldPop is a nice open data set that may well give us the, the kind of at least broad population data that we need um, to consider. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of um, kind of my, my talk on open GIS and open data for flood vulnerability. So hopefully you've kind of found that that interesting. So to summarize, I think open source tools and data sets are becoming increasingly powerful and comprehensive. You know, I almost think there's no reason almost to, to pay for GIS software these days. There's so many tools that will do everything that most of the commercial packages will do, help save our budgets. And it also means that if you've got anyone in your organization that's got the skills to use them, if you're not making use of GIS at the moment, then there's the ability to start kind of bringing that into your tool set um, and using it to, to support the work that you do. And hopefully, by combining the free data sets and free tools, it's going to allow us to do things that we might not feasibly be able to do with the, the time, cost, and resource limitations that, that we'd have. Um, and in addition, we can also use platforms like OpenStreetMap to encourage volunteers to engage with the work we're doing and potentially to, to kind of give back some of the data that we have and actually share that, make it available to others 
so that we can increase the, the benefit of the, the data that we, we have available. So that's the end of, of um, my, my talk. Um, I don't know whether you want me to say anything about the exercise yet, Namrata, or should we just open it to, to questions? Uh, well, uh, they haven't started the exercise yet. It was uh, it should be done after your talk, and uh, obviously they have had a look at the exercise. But I think I will open the um, okay. uh, um, open uh, the floor for questions first, and see if they have any questions, and we can discuss on the exercise a little bit, uh, depending on what questions do they have. So okay. uh, yes, yeah, so the floor is all yours. Uh, yeah, Andrew is there, so ask any questions. Do you think uh, anything that comes to your mind after hearing his presentation? The importance of open source data, importance of open, open source software. What do you think? Uh, how can that uh, be used in the Brazilian context, uh, in the context uh, of uh, water extremes, uh, water security, what you are working on uh, in hydrological context? Uh, think about that. And Andrew is here, so this is your chance to ask some questions. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes. The first question, Andrew. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cesar. I have a question about word pop. Uh, yeah. Do, do, do you know if there is somewhere that we can put uh, the population, the growth of refugees? Ah, that's a good question. I don't think, from what I've done with it, I don't think that's something that they um, they have in there at the moment. Um, quite possibly, the methodology that they use could be used to look at the growth of refugees. So one thing I didn't mention is they also project forwards in their, their data sets. So actually, they're, they don't just have kind of current and past population, they do project that forwards into the future. So I don't think they have that on there at the moment, but on the other hand, it could be worth looking at some of the, the literature on the, the methodologies that they use and seeing whether that could actually be, be used to um, generate a similar data set for, for refugee populations. Okay, thank you. Okay. Andrew, can you expand your uh, screen to full screen, please? Uh, I don't know if, uh, if you can move my video away from there. Um, oh. oh, OK. Oh, Actually, yeah, this is OK. Uh, we have already seen the presentation. This is better. Yeah, <laughs> We want to see you now. <laughs> 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 OK. Uh, yes, any other question? Anything from here? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. It's me again. Uh, okay. Now it's about OpenStreet. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I want to know if we we have to to put, for example, if I if I get if I want to to study a city, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't have uh, nobody nobody studied that that area before, so I yeah. have to put the data there, or I can import from somewhere. Um. You can do either. So obviously, the first thing to do is to see what mapping there is, um, because it may be that there's been someone locally who's who's added things. Um, if not, you, there's various ways that you can import data. So you, I think you can import GPS data. Um, you can import shape files. If, so if you have or other GIS data sets. So if you already have your own mapping data that you want to add in, and um, you can do that. Or there is satellite imagery high resolution satellite imagery, um, which you'd be able to go in and actually use to kind of digitize features yourself um, and contribute them to the, the open street map in, in that area. So yeah, there's a whole range of different ways that you can actually add the data in. Um, if you've got it from another source that, that's kind of, you know, you can, that you're able to add in, then that's, that's great. Um, but quite a few areas, it's surprising how many areas do have at least some mapping um, already in place. Um, on OpenStreetMap. Okay, thank you again. Okay. Any more questions? Anybody else using OpenStreetMap or open data at all? Yeah, okay. Hi, Andrew. My name is Gabriela, Hi. and what I'm concerned about is the spatial resolution of open data. 
Sometimes I want to work with open data sources, but the spatial resolution is too big. And if I'm working with a small basin, I can't work. So can you comment something, comment something about that? Yeah, I mean, all of the examples that I've kind of focused on in this presentation, I've, I've picked because they're, they're global, but often the, the trade-off obviously is that they're, they're lower resolution. I mean, what kind of, of, kind of resolution are you, you needing for your, your work? Well, I need kind of big resolution, uh, like 30 kilometers per 30 kilometers a, a pixel, and sometimes they are they are like 200 kilometers. They are too okay. big for me. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the data sets that I've been looking at here are much higher resolution. I mean, as I said, that it's like the SRTM elevation data is actually 30 by or round about 30 by 30 meters, um, one arc, arc second. Um, I think the world pop is also similarly about. 30 by 30 meters, um, and obviously OpenStreetMap is is kind of vector data. So I think it probably depends on the type of data that you're using, but certainly there's there's higher resolution data sets out there in a lot of cases. What type um, of data are you looking for? Like I'm what is for land use data? Land use data. Yes. Oh, what sort of land I, use data is available, Andrew? Oh, I'm trying to remember on a global scale. I can think of some European ones, um, but I can't remember. Um, I can't think off the top of my head in terms of global land cover data, so I'd probably have to go away and, and have a look. Um, okay, obviously, yeah, well, the other option is to use things like hmm. freely available satellite imagery to, to do your own land cover classification, but obviously that takes a lot more time and effort. So there's things yes. like Landsat data that's yeah. kind of 30 meter resolution that in theory you could um, use to run an image classification to identify different land cover types. But obviously, as I said, that does take a lot more time and effort than yeah. um, if there's a, a readily available land cover, land cover map you can use. But once you, if you don't have and uh, you use whatever you're getting for free, isn't it? So uh, when I was doing my land use classification, I used Landsat data. Uh, yeah. That's the best I could get. Uh, so most probably till now it's the same. That's the best we could use. So Landsat, yeah. So that's one ex um, option for countries which are developing and also uh, in order to get it for free. Most probably there yeah. will be other data sets which are available at a finer resolution, but then you have to buy the data, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's also Sentinel, um, if you want to, again, if you're doing image classification, there's the European Sentinel-2 data, which is actually, um, I think it's at 15 meter resolution, so actually quite a bit higher than, than Landsat, and that's freely available as well now. Um, but that's only so. in Europe? No, that's global. Global scale, okay, so yeah. that's another yeah. option you have. So yay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so anyone else has any more questions on that? Because this world pop uh, data, that seemed to be quite interesting. Uh, I haven't heard of that before. And I think that's, in, especially if you are working with people, uh, if you need some socioeconomic data, uh, population comes as the first thing that you look at a, a certain mm. place in order to understand the risk uh, and the vulnerability. So I think that can be a very useful uh, tool, uh, free resource that we can use, even for your exercise, you can think of that. Um, yeah. Andrew, I have one quick question yeah. um, regarding the authenticity of data. So yeah. you know, often uh, we hear a lot about free data, open data, but then how far can we trust that data, especially volunteer data, things like everybody will be able, can upload data. So yeah, I mean, it can be, can be an issue potentially. Yeah. I, mean, I think, um, in most cases, so things like OpenStreetMap, there are sort of administrators who at least briefly check um, some of the data that's that's added in. There is there is the risk that somebody could go in and add false yeah. data, but to be honest, nobody really benefits from it. So I think in most cases, it's unlikely that most of the, the issues that actually come up with are where um, you get what are called edit wars, where actually two people disagree on whether something's used for a particular purpose. So for example, there might be an unofficial shortcut that's used in an area that's not really a, a path and one person keeps adding it in as a path and someone yeah. else keeps taking it back out and that kind of thing. 
Um, but I've never come across anyone who's had major issues in terms of kind of people adding essentially false data into hmm. to OpenStreetMap or, or similar. So yeah, so it is, it is a risk, but I think it does seem to be something that in reality is, is quite rare. Okay, yeah. All right, so anyone else wants to ask any questions regarding the um, exercise or regarding open source software, or open data, anything else that comes to your mind? Okay, uh, as uh, I have Andrew's, uh, you all have Andrew's uh, contact details. So if you come think of any other question, uh, I'm sure he will be happy to respond to you. So send an email yeah. to him. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, no, no problem at all. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the, the event. That was very useful, yes. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you for our presentation. Have a good day, or evening, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.